Nice. Thank you so much, Claire. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, this is so <laughs> fun. This is so Hi, fun. Friend. So um, thank you everyone for being here with us today. I'm so excited that I get to talk to Carolyn and then I'll everybody else who has questions a little bit later about all good things art and art history weirdness. So Carolyn, you and I have known each other almost 10 years, I think. It's wild. Yeah, it's wild. It's, it's gone really quickly. So I met you first when we did a studio visit because yes. you're an artist, amazing artist. Um, and I fell in love with your work right away. And I understood that you could just, um, you, you did fun and also this kind of wacky offbeat type of work, which is something that I totally appreciate. Um, as somebody who focuses with contemporary art, it's like a lot of it can be really, really, really heavy. And so sometimes it's really nice to have something that has a lot of levity in it. And so your work, I love because I could just, I see both of it. You know, you were also talking about some heavy topics also, but then you have this interest in lightening things up. So um, we were kindred spirits, I felt like right away. Absolutely. I feel the same way. I think um, I still remember that studio visit and I still remember the collaborations that we had since then. And um, it's just amazing to see where you've taken your incredible curatorial knowledge and what you've done with this book. I love it so much. I've just been enjoying it even more today and learning all about Homa of Klimt. It's been awesome. Um, yeah, so I'm excited for this conversation. I do yes. just want to congratulate you on the book. Thank you. Came out September 15th. And we do just want to say thank you to Andy's Books for hosting us. Um, and I just want to let everyone know we're going to be chatting for about 40 minutes and then we'll be taking, taking some questions at the end. This might have already been mentioned, but feel free to use that QA. Um, and yeah, we're gonna get started here. So if you're a fan of Jennifer Dassel's five-year-old Art Curious podcast, I'm definitely a fan, I hope you are too. Um, this book is really cool because there's new stories in there that um, explore the theme that we love of the unexpected, the slightly odd and the strangely wonderful. And there's just so much amazing praise for this, which I understand why um, being called lively, accessible and engaging. Um, and others that said it will forever change the way you look at some of the world's best loved artworks. I feel completely true about that. And the chapter about Hieronymus Bosch in particular, um, I'm already feeling that way about. But we're getting to it. Yes, yeah, so we're going to get to it. Jen, talk to us. Tell yeah. us how you came into the art world. Um, I know it was a little bit of a sideways direction, and that can feel intimidating for some, but I feel like that's an important part of your story. It is. Yeah, you're totally right, because I grew up basically, and I, I talk about this a little bit at the beginning of the introduction to the book, which is that I never had any experience with art when I was growing up. There was maybe one, maybe two. I, I barely remember any of this, so I must have blocked it out, like trips to the local art museum that I mean, really, I remember nothing. I know it happened, but it had no impression on me at all. And I didn't grow up in a family that was really interested in art, which is really funny because my mom is super interested in all things cultural. And like, she would take me to the theater and to the ballet. And, you know, she really encouraged me to read a lot of great books and things like that. But the art side of things, the visual art side of things was just non-existent. The only thing I really remember about art, art at all when I was really young was that in my mom and dad's bedroom, they had this framed Monet poster. And of course, all it said, you know, it was like a water lilies and it just said Claude Monet. And <laughs> I had no idea, obviously, who that was. I thought it was some like contemporary artist, because to me, it just looked like something I would see anywhere. Uh, and I just thought, oh, okay, well, that, that looks nice. And that was my estimation of art at the very best. At the very least, I was like, this is so boring. This is not me. I was really much more interested in science. So I was the kid with the rock collection and I wanted to be a paleontologist all the way up until I was a, almost a junior in college. So that was my career goal. And art was never part of the picture, but long story, not short at all. I'm sorry, I ramble. Uh, I ended up in my first art history class purely by accident. So I could not get into any other like humanities based classes. I had all of the things I needed for my geology major. I had chemistry and 
calculus and all that good stuff, but you know, you've got to tick off those humanities requirements for graduation and everything I wanted to do that were like, you know, great books or folk tales and fairy tales and music courses, they were all basically like, you know, whatever they were um, sold out, <laughs> the equivalent of sold out. Um, they were full. And so I couldn't register into any of them. I kept trying. I got really frustrated. So I ended up having to go see a course counselor and just say like, help me. I am not finding anything. I need something. And she opened a course catalog, which was like, this thick, it was all the classes. It was like a phone book. And I often tell people who are younger than me, they're like, I don't know what a phone book is. <laughs> like it's a big book, really <laughs> heavy. And she opened it to the letter A and was basically stopped right away and said, art history, hold on. A lot of people take art history. Let's just see if there's any space. And she didn't really even ask me. She just went over to her computer, logged in and registered me. And I had nothing like I had no response other than to be like oh my god that's <laughs> not what I wanted because I thought it was going to be awful I thought it was going to be so dull and boring and it turned out not to be it turned out that a couple mm -hmm. weeks later I was looking forward to that class more than any other one and I made it official a couple of years later because I just realized that I had fallen so quickly and so deeply in love with art that I didn't want to do anything else anymore. And mm. so that's how it started. So I often think, you know, just thinking about God or fate or the universe or whatever you want to call it, because it was not in my hands. And it's insane to think what we've been able to do, you know, as <laughs> my family or, or me, just because of this purely accidental or what felt to me like accident at the time. Um, went all through college studying art history, went to grad school for art history, and then 13 years ago, uh, ended up at the North Carolina Museum of Art, where I've been ever since. So it's been almost 14 wow. years, which is crazy. Oh my god, I love that story. <laughs> no, I know. It's very weird, though, because I feel like a lot of people who I talk to who are artists or involved in the arts, um, because you grew up, did you, I mean, you went to RISD, so like you had lots of art interests, I'm sure, from the beginning. Yeah, I was steered there. Yes, for sure. I was, I was making the art. It was happening. There, there yeah. it happened. Yeah. Yeah. But I feel like that is what I love about your podcast and book, though, is um, just how much it is about just like storytelling, you know, because like art can have this like complicated space for many of us for various yeah. reasons. Um, and just like spending more time with your books today and thinking about times that I've listened to your podcast, it's just like getting wrapped into these like amazing mystery stories, these like <laughs> romances or these like hilarious stories. And it just makes it so fun. It makes the art like less about um, this like cultural uh, totem in life that might feel intimidating and more just like this element of about human nature and um, yeah, or like a great foil in a story. Um, yeah. yeah. But you're totally right, because I think in so many ways, art feels really intimidating. Mm -hmm. And you know that as much as I do, uh, you know, coming from the artist side of things. It's the same thing with the curators, where when I'm talking to somebody just in my daily travels, like everyday people, and I say like, oh, I work at the art museum and I curate modern and contemporary art. You either, I feel like I either get people saying, oh, I love it. Oh, I'm going to New York next week. I can't wait to see these eight galleries. I'm so excited. Or I get the people who are like, I have no idea what a curator is, which is fine. It's a weird job description. Um, so I get it. Or I get the people who are like, oh, I don't like the museum because it's really boring. And I only go because the hamburger at the cafe is really good, which is it totally is really valid. Good. You know, it is good. That's okay. <laughs> if, you're, if art isn't your thing, it doesn't have to be your thing. But I also feel like whenever I have those conversations, I step back because I say, I totally get it because I used to feel exactly the same way you do. And I don't expect everybody to love art and that is completely fine. You don't have to, but I always like to tell people, you know, if you want to get interested for me, the way that it worked was to tell a good story because that first art history professor 
was talking about cave paintings and I thought, mm. oh my gosh, like what is exciting about a handprint on a wall? But he spun those stories. And so that mm. literally stories about art changed my life. And so I tell people like, sometimes you just need a really good story to get you into it. And so that's part of the thing with the book where it's like, I'm going to tell you the odd, unexpected, funny, weird stories, because I think a lot of people, we don't get that all the time. That's not what, <laughs> that's not what I do often when I'm giving a lecture, you know, I'm more of like a dry academic tone. I try to liven it up as much as I can, but you know, there's a certain way that art is often presented even by artists, even by curators, it's just in general, we have this particular art speak that we do, and it can be mm. super hard for non-art people to break into that, I think. That was one of the reasons why I started the podcast in the first mm. place, was that I wanted it to be a space to tell those stories that you're not going to hear, because it's not about why a particular painting is important, or a particular sculpture is important, you know, what it means for art history, I'm just going to tell you a weird story that is about it or about the person who made it mm. with hope that it's fun, first of all. And then if you learn something along the way, I always tell people, you know, that's gravy. I, I love that. But I also just want you to have a good time reading the book. And or you're such a good all. storyteller. So like this all just makes sense. Um, I like today I was reading and okay, actually, how do you pronounce Jor is it Georgiana Houghton? Houghton? Yes, Georgiana Houghton. Yeah. Okay. Oof. The way you just said that, beautiful. Um. Yeah, I was getting so sucked into the way you were telling the story about her today, and just um how fascinating it was that her and um Hilma Off Klimt had such similar lives in a way, yet they never met, and no. with both having sisters that died, and then being in you know getting pulled into the spiritualist movement as a way to make abstraction. Um, but I found myself, you know, even though as an art teacher, I did a project with my ninth graders about Hilma off Clinton abstraction this year. I was like, oh my God, like getting pulled into this mysterious story about these women who are fascinated about communicating with the dead. Like, I was like, I wish I had this to tell my students. Um, just, <laughs> I just love the way you told it. It was so fascinating. Thank you. But I think that's also the great thing about art history is that there's always more to know. And mm. I mean, even for me, it's like, I've been studying art history since the late nineties. There's still just an obscene amount of stuff that I don't know that I learn something new every day. So mm. I feel like you had a lot of information, probably a ton that you were able to pass on to your students. And then there's like more, there's mm. never a lack of stuff to enjoy, which is really cool. Um, that's one of the fun things I think for me, especially about doing the book and the podcast is that I have gotten to learn so much <laughs> that I don't think I would have ever gotten the chance to learn because, mm. you know, I focus mostly with 20th and 21st century art on a day-to-day -day basis for the museum. So I don't get to dip in to a lot of what I very lovingly call the old stuff um, <laughs> be because that's how I was, you know, how I came up in art history was not in contemporary art, but my specialty until I got the job at North Carolina and partway through my PhD program was I was focusing on 18th and 19th century French painting. So much older than what I do now during, you know, during the day. And so this has really been a wonderful opportunity to dip back into some of that beautiful old stuff that I love. So I feel like I get to play in like both playgrounds mm. simultaneously, which is really cool. And then okay. learn all this stuff that I, if I hadn't done the podcast or the book that I wouldn't have learned about. So it's pretty cool. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> so fun. It um, fun. So tell us a little bit more about your writing process. Um, you know, as we're talking about, there's all these mysterious, weird stories that you're unearthing. Like you must run it. Like you said, you, you're running across so many fascinating pieces of information. How did you choose the stories that went into your book? Like, yeah, just tell us a little bit more about the writing process for this book. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think before I get to the book, I'll even mm. just start out with the ideas behind the first episodes of the podcast. Right. So going into it, I have no audio experience. I have no podcast experience. I just basically was like, let's do a podcast. That sounds fun. 
it's really hard. <laughs> it's a lot harder than I thought. So it was kind of a trial by fire, but it's, I hope it's, it's worked out. I've enjoyed it. I've learned a lot. Um, but at the very beginning, I kept this big, long running list, like a physical list in a notebook. I still have the notebook and I just wrote down ideas for things that I thought would be fun. So it started just with stories that I thought would be enjoyable that I wanted to tell. Mm. And then what was cool was that once you know, people outside of my family or friend groups started listening to the show is that people would then write in and tell me what they wanted to hear about. And so this is still happening constantly. And I love that because I get introduced to so many really weird, cool stories and very amazing artists that I would have never heard of from all over the world. So it's been a really nice thing to kind of be able to combine my interests with other people's interests and see where those meet in the middle, I suppose you could say. So that was really how everything started on that end. And then for the book, uh, when I ended up getting the book deal with Penguin Random House, you know, I had all this content, but I was already providing it for free. <laughs> so, you know, we wanted to be able to give something to the audience so that it would be a good benefit for like actually reading a book. Because, you know, who's going to want to read what you had already heard for free two years ago? So I knew that we wanted it to be mostly new content. And it is. It's about 60 or 65% brand new. And then all of the little tangential elements. I have all these little, um, we call them snackables. Like Okay, I love those. Like I know what you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> yes. they're so fun. Yes, Those were almost ridiculously fun for me to write because they're just these little bites size stories. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's all new stuff as well. Uh, but what was really funny was that in thinking about all these new stories that I wanted to tell, some things came to mind right away. And then some were, I really had to kind of mull on for a while. Mm -hmm. So the thing that came right away was right back in that first notebook where I started writing down ideas for the podcast, like at the very beginning, and I never ended up doing it ended up being the first chapter in the book. And that's the chapter about the impressionists and, you know, really hearkening back to that poster on my parents' wall wow. in their bedroom, because mm. my concept when I was growing up and also into the very early careers of me studying art history, I just thought the impressionists were so boring. <laughs> and I just thought it was, you know, a bunch of pretty flowers or some dappled ladies sitting in the sun holding umbrellas. And I was like, oh, it's just pretty. And that is it. Mm. Only to find out after I was studying art history for a couple of years and finally getting to the point of learning about Impressionism that these guys were insane. Well, guys and ladies were just super badasses mm. because they were really re rebelling against everything that came before in a huge huh. way. And so we really forget that at the time, especially in Paris, when they were first coming up, that their work was just hated and mm. people made fun of them. And the name Impressionism, you know, it, it came from a uh, a critic who basically was saying that as kind of a slur. It's like, oh, they're just dabbing at paint and making impressions of a scene and not a real scene. And mm. the artists were like, yes, you're right. <laughs> that is what we're doing. And it's amazing because they ran with that. It's like they appropriated a term that was supposed to be a diss. And instead they were like, yes, let's, let's do that. And so we forget, you know, with the distance of over a hundred years, we forget how radical they were. And so for me, that was a game changer in learning to enjoy their works of art and appreciate them in a new way. And so I wanted to tell that story because it is so easy to look at a Renoir painting or a Monet painting and just think about like my mom's umbrella that has a water lily on it. <laughs> Because she has. I want to see umbrella. that umbrella. <laughs> exactly. This is not a metaphor. It's like it's a real thing. You go into any museum store and it's like Claude Monet on a t shirt and on a scarf. And it's so beautiful, mm -hmm. so beautiful that that's how it's really perceived and used for a lot of people. So that was the first thing that I really wanted to write about. I'll give you another example. Um, the other thing that I knew that I wanted to write about right away ended up not making it into the book, except in one of those little call out sections. And it was something 
thing I was really excited to write about and it just did not work. It was really almost to the very end of the first draft of the book that I was really struggling with it. And it was a chapter that was supposed to be on still life painting because I love still lifes. They're pretty, they're beautiful. I love a good bowl of fruit and (laughs) a good bouquet of flowers. But again, it's the backstory of learning that those things actually have a rather dark history. Oh, Because when they started getting really popular, especially in the Northern countries, so thinking about Holland and Flanders in the 1600s, they were really meant to be these images that were like memento mori. So time Mm. is passing, death is coming, there's no escaping it. So it was like, these flowers are drooping, Mm. this apple is going to rot, Mm. everything is going to die, and so are you. So you better you know, you better act, act wisely and think well about, you know, your God and all that good stuff. So they were really kind of stark reminders of mortality. That was their Mm. purpose. They were also beautiful and were meant to be beautiful also, but they had that dark undertone. And so I think that obviously completely changes how you perceive a bowl of cherries that's painted on a, hanging on a museum wall. Mm -hmm. I could not For some reason, I just couldn't make that story cool enough. So Mm -hmm. I eventually cut it completely. Hmm. I did replace it with the chapter on the CIA. So I think it worked (laughs) out better in the long run. But I still love those cool, creepy death still life paintings. Maybe so fast. Yeah, next time. I know. I'm like, I need that chapter. I need that full book, actually. Um, No. I know. I think for me as a contemporary artist, like I don't always spend enough time with these genres or maybe these, um, uh, yeah, collections of work that might have been more instituted on umbrellas. And um, (laughs) I don't have to though. So that's (laughs) the great thing. It's like, you don't have to because you're making your own stuff. You're Mm. doing it. But I understand your point. Yeah. It's so powerful to, um, reinvestigate and reconnect to the original reason the work was made and to feel how radical it was at the time um and that is such a powerful reminder I feel like for contemporary artists or for me as an artist um just remembering that yeah it's not our job to necessarily make what has been comfortable in the past like all this work is meaningful because it did something at the time that was challenging or was dark or was unsettling or Um, I don't know. That's exciting for me to. No, I love that. And I think that's so true. And I have thought about that a lot because so many works of art that we just take for granted in many ways, or assume that they've always been super popular because we've been going to museums for a couple centuries to go see them, things like that. When that is not always the case. Like I'm thinking about the Sistine Chapel ceiling and Michelangelo's Mm -hmm. last judgment and stuff in Rome and that's like one of the number one stops that if you go to Italy and you go to Rome, you go to see the Sistine Chapel ceiling and much like there were major parts of that, that was just hated. And people thought like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? And they were disastrous and shocking or, Mm. or, you know, rejected by patrons. There's all these amazing stories in art history of works that we just love today as a culture that, whoever was actually commissioning them ended up just basically disregarding because they thought it was awful. Um, So watching things change over time and watching Mm. people take risks only to see that it works out in the long run, like sometimes the really long run, but still (laughs) the point still stands like Mm. taking risks in art. That's a really important thing. That's why we talk about a lot of the artists that we talk about today in art Mm. history is because they did something big and they took those risks. They made wow. something that was uncomfortable. That's why they're standing out. Mm, amazing, amazing. Um, okay, tell us some more stories from the book. This is so fun. Was there any that any stories or any chapters that surprised you as you wrote them that kind of took you by surprise? I think I think that still life chapter is the okay. one that was <laughs> most of a surprise. Um, I can tell you my favorite chapter to Perfect. write. Yes, that was also. I guess it wasn't surprising that I enjoyed it so much because I knew going into it that it was going to be really fun. And I want especially to talk about it with you and we'll talk, we'll tell everybody why, but this is the chapter about Hieronymus Bosch, 
So um, this was, I guess, almost 10 years ago. Yeah. Again, trying to make a long story short. <laughs> if you know this painting, The Garden of Earthly Delights, feel free to look it up if you don't have a mental image of it in your head on your computer. But um, it's this triple scene. It's three, three panels. It's called a triptych that shows basically on the left side, you have a scene of paradise of heaven. And the center is basically what's called the garden of earthly delight. So it's your, your earth, it's people cavorting on earth. And then you have those people basically who were cavorting and doing all kinds of amazing things, then have their hell <laughs> next to them. So it's this like moralistic painting basically um, from Hieronymus Bosch, who was a painter, in, a Dutch painter, I believe. Sometimes I get fuzzy on who's Dutch and who's Flemish, but I think <laughs> Don't quote me on that. Uh, from like the really early Northern Renaissance. So really bridging the gap in many ways between um, like medieval art and coming into the very early Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And if anyone has seen an image of this or you know had the fortune to see it in person, if you have any knowledge of this work, then you know that it is just jam packed <laughs> with just amazing weird things like anything you can imagine like especially in the hellscape right Carolyn it's oh like, yeah <laughs> it's insane there's like a giant ear that has a knife and it's walking mm. down the scene there's a giant egg person that yeah. I think has Hieronymus Bosch's face is what the story so. is yeah I mean this is on the mild side there's a lot <laughs> going on it's crazy. <laughs> it's it's totally crazy mm. and there is this little man that's kind of just I mean he's not hidden by any means there is another <laughs> figure who's like pointing at this little man <laughs> all you see is his rear end his naked rear end sticking up and if you look closely it has musical notes <laughs> emblazoned on it and about 10 years ago this college student in Oklahoma who herself was a music major just was staying up late one night and she had just learned about this painting and she was looking it up online and she was like, oh, musical notes. I'm going to transcribe those into <laughs> modern day musical notation and I'm going to see what it sounds like. And it's three, you know, six seconds long. It's really short. It's nothing fancy. And it doesn't sound like anything. It's just like, <laughs> it's, it's not good. But she wrote about it on like a Tumblr blog or something and just at two in the morning hit enter and then told everybody, you know, like, oh, I transcribed this butt music from Hieronymus Bosch. And <laughs> it just blew, you know, it like broke the internet, the art side of the internet, which I know is really small, but still it broke the art side of the internet for like a full couple of weeks or something. And it sort of took it on a new life of its own where people then took this new transcription and then they made their own versions of it so there was like a heavy metal version there was a Gregorian chant version and so you'll see all around that people will just call it like butt music from hell and it's really ridiculous and I love it because I mean how can you not laugh at that and thinking about the work and once you really look at the work especially that hellscape the more you look at it the more you find that there's something to laugh at because it's just silly. It's <laughs> ridiculous. I mean, there's plenty going on. I think that it could make you kind of be scared of like, oh, I definitely don't want to go to hell where this pig nun is trying to make out with me or, you know, it's just silly things, but it's so funny that I think the humor of Hieronymus Bosch is something that's understated or or at least not discussed as much as many other people think where I think we take him so seriously but looking at his own ideas about what hell could be or even the, the you know the garden of earthly delights the paradise scenes they're so fantastical that you've got to think that he had this amazing sense of humor and he was using that for good reason to get you to look further into his painting mm. and, and understand it a little bit more. So mm. it is a serious scene, but it's also a really funny scene. Mm. And I want to talk about, you're very familiar. With this <laughs> I am. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about this. So I got you to do yeah. a project and our, our yes. previous director at the museum. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh, it was 
such a fun collaboration. So epic. Definitely the most insane project that I've personally done. But um, yeah, I'd say around 2013, 2014. And it was fun reading your chapter today and just like noting how much that was in the zeitgeist. That was um, completely in the zeitgeist. Yeah, you you doing this commission at the same time as, I mean, that's really about the same year or maybe yeah. a year after the butt music was happening. Yay. So Bosch was really happening. Yeah. He was speaking to us all. Um, yes, <laughs> maybe through spiritualism, but um, yeah. So in my work, I make digitally constructed landscapes in Photoshop. And um, sometimes they're very serene and elegant. And then sometimes they're completely the opposite and quite like ridiculous. Um, really influenced and interested in digital kitsch and kind of like coming of age and MySpace Tumblr era and using that aesthetic um, in Photoshop to explore these sort of traditional motifs in art history. Um, but Bosch is all, I mean, I don't think I'm alone in this. I'm not the first to find him to be a huge muse. And um, it was just a dream project of mine to recreate that piece at the scale of the original um, but to replace all the figures, um, I use self-portraiture a lot in my work, so I got to play all the characters, and I, I got to play God, I got to be Adam, I got to be Eve, I got to be everybody in hell, and um, it, you know, it was, uh, that piece almost broke me. I, <laughs> I, I, got, I got to go to, um, it was so generous of the museum to support me going to Madrid, and so I could study the original at the Prado, which was amazing. Um, and then working on it, just like creating each individual pose, costumes for each figure. And um, there was just a certain kind of madness that it required where it really just like unraveled me. And I feel like the piece unraveled in some ways. And I think, um, you know, I'm thinking about one of my uh, professors that's influenced me the most, Jeff Whetstone, and how he just always wanted to encourage us to make massive failures. And I think entering, entering into Bosch's madness, like allowed me to kind of go into that complete mess. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was fun to make the piece. I got a hot pink frame for it. Everything I love. When I finally got to visit in person, because it got made, I was here in California when I made it. And then it was printed and created over there on the East Coast. Um, I showed up in like a Bosch outfit that was that I got off Amazon that had the original piece and just like hung out by the piece with some like lovely North Carolina folks and it was a special time. <laughs> I love it. I love it yeah. so much. That work is, um, I mean, it's a, it's a photo based work. So works mm. on paper, we have to rotate yes. in and out to the collection because they're light sensitive. So that's my only uh, sad thing is that I can't keep it up all the time. So if it goes on view, it needs to be off view and basically resting in storage at our museum uh, for three times the amount of time that it was on view. So if it was on view for six months, for example, then I got to keep it in the dark for a year and a half. So I don't get to see your work as much as I want. But we did this amazing project just in the last year at the museum that was called Interchanges that was really mixing our collection up a little bit more than we had ever previously done. So we reinstalled your piece in our Northern Renaissance gallery, and it was parallel with this last judgment scene oh, wow. on the other wall, which ah! is really fun. And then it is just such a blast, I think, to walk into a gallery expecting to see a lot of these dark old master paintings and then be confronted with that bright pink frame. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. And I, I've got to think like if, if Bosch were here today, I mean, I don't know anything about Bosch and we don't really actually know a ton about Bosch, but the more you dig into his work, the more you see that precedent for humor. So yeah. I think, I think he would like your interpretation because it is really funny and weird and true to the original in that same kind of spirit. Hmm. So um, I think that's something that is pretty cool and underestimated in art in general is that sense of humor. I love that. I love that. And I feel like reading the chapter, I really got that deeper. Um, just that he, because I understood that his sort of um, sincere religious perspective was influencing the work, even though we look yeah. at it with modern contemporary eyes and, you know, it just seems loopy. But um, yeah. to know that humor was actually also probably intentional was something yes. I didn't know. Um, and it made him feel like more of a kindred spirit. 
I maybe yeah. I could get him to wear one of those all Bosch outfits from Amazon with me. Oh I feel God. like that that would be a dream come true. <laughs> we all just need to buy this. Really, yes. Awesome. Go on Amazon, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, just just for the Bosch, and then you can get back off. It. That's the only reason. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is so fun. Um, Wow. So is there any other stories you want to share from the book or any other moments that you're thinking about? Or should we go to Q&A? What, what's on your mind? Yeah. Um. Let's see. I think I, I just saw like a burst of something from the mm, Q&A briefly. Okay. And I think somebody asked about the CIA mm, chapter. Mm, mm. Um, yes. Let me see. So, oh, yes. You just said, um, Susan says, tell about the chapter of the CIA. I want to know how that fits with art. Okay. So this is a really interesting story. And this is one of those things I, I mentioned at the beginning about not knowing, you know, that one of, let me back up. One of the things that's been really great about doing the podcast that led into the book is that I have been able to learn all these new things that I don't even know about art and I'm still continuing learning. And when I was just beginning the podcast, I had maybe done four or five episodes at this point. So it was really brand new. This was 2016. And one of the first emails I got from a listener was somebody wrote in and said, ooh, I have a really great idea for a story. Do you know about the CIA's connection to abstract expressionism? And I said, no, I don't. I have no idea what you're talking about. And this guy said, oh my gosh, I'm going to send you a link. And it was a link to this New Yorker article that came out, I guess about 15 years ago. And mm. it was all about that this, this fact that this mission from the CIA had gotten declassified in the late 90s, early 2000s, that was um, basically, in short, a way to fight the Cold War. So uh, using abstract painting. And so via something that was called the long leash policy where they were several degrees removed from these artists, but especially painters. So people like Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, Helen Frankenthaler, um, Clifford Still, people like that. So like mid-century American painting. Uh, you know, these were people who were creating works of art that were not necessarily about anything. They were works of art. It was art for the sake of art. And that was something that the CIA thought that they could use in conjunction with their other topics for showing the greatness of a capitalist society versus a communist or socialist society. And so the big thing in Russia at that point, the USSR, was that social realist painting was the number one thing. And so as artists, you really weren't able to create a scene that you wanted to create or a landscape painting that you wanted to create. You had to create something that towed the line about what the, was great about the USSR. So it was very strict what you were allowed and not allowed to do. Whereas in the US, the idea was like, we're this amazing free country. You can make art about anything. You could make art about nothing. You could make art that was just a splatter on a wall and become hugely famous because of it. And so this idea crystallized where they began these touring exhibitions that began in the 40s, lasted until the early 60s. And they toured exhibitions of abstract works and then later abstract expressionist specific works throughout the world, but especially to countries that they felt were kind of on the line between deciding if they wanted to go with the capitalist model or the wow. socialist model. Wow. And this was their way of being like, just basically saying, look how great freedom is that you can do these wow. amazing things. Um, and, you know, who knows if it worked or not. But one of the really interesting things is that when you start digging into these stories, you're looking at people like Jackson Pollock and noticing that around the early 50s, all of a sudden he just explodes on the scene and becomes really popular in the US at a point where the average American and also even a lot of people within the art world in New York, they weren't loving on abstract expressionism. They weren't huge on Jackson Pollock, except for people like Clement Greenberg, who was a really big art critic and a few other people and you know the assorted museum folks, the people you'd expect. But all of a sudden, Jackson Pollock is on Life magazine and, you know, he's getting a documentary made about him and he's on TV and he becomes more of a household name. And the theory that a lot of historians now have is that 
that was because the CIA were kind of pushing him forward very covertly. You know, again, by this image of degrees, they were using fronts based on some wealthy donors who would then come in and have ties to museums, like MoMA was one of the big ones. And the artists, for the most part, never knew because a lot of them were, you know, really affiliated with the Communist Party in general. A lot of these people had associations with other people from Europe who were part of that scene and who were anarchic in some cases. So they needed to do this in some sort of weird secretive way so that no one would know, not the artist and not the people who were there were showing this exhibition to around the world. So they did it in a very covert way. They often had independent funding and they created these front organizations to funnel the money in to support this. This is all very convoluted. I hopefully do a better job of explaining it in the book, but it is amazing. And then I also like to end by just saying like the Metropolitan Museum in New York is always like a very staid and kind of stolid institution. It has, and still to a degree is a little hesitant to make big changes. And they, for the longest time, they're better now. But for the longest time, they were not open or interested in um, collecting contemporary art. And just a year after Jackson Pollock died, they bought one of his paintings. And there was no precedent for this. And Pollock was, of course, a known figure by then, but he was still kind of mid-career. He wasn't even established, really, when he died. He was popular, but he wasn't, I guess, tried and true in the way that the kind of artists that they normally would have collected at the Met were. And so the, again, this idea was that there were these behind the scenes little machinations going on to show that people like Pollock were you know, respected and were critically lauded. And that a lot of that was sort of uh, pushed from behind the scenes and not necessarily the art world. So the question is, would abstract expressionism become so huge? Would it have made such an impact without a little bit of the behind the scenes push from the CIA, from the government? Ooh. I don't have the answer to that, but I like to think that it's pretty radical in and of itself. So I am apt to think that it probably would have made a big splash anyway, but to the same degree, I don't know. So it's really interesting. Wow. Wow. I know. It's crazy. I did stuff. not know all that. That is, I need to read that chapter. Okay, that is shocking. I mean, I think um, when this man first emailed me to tell me about it, I thought, oh, this is such a conspiracy theory. This is cannot be real. <laughs> but then I read that New Yorker article he passed to me and I said, oh my gosh, this, this is real. This isn't, this is not a fake story. This really happened. And, you know, they only had just in the past 15, 20 years declassified the documents about it. This was a real thing. So fighting a cold war with art. It, I mean, that's cool. That's cool. It's fascinating. That is fascinating. Um, wow. So are there more questions that you want to answer from the chat? I have a yeah. question. Ooh. Oh yeah. Hi. Uh, okay. So I promise I, I'm not going to make you give away the whole book, but I am wondering what your favorite snackable is, mm. you know, like that one is or even just one that you like, maybe not your favorite. Maybe. We can oh. Back. oh my gosh. Now I'm like, Oh, I have like 30 snackables, which one's my favorite? <laughs> the first one that pops in my mind is, I'm just gonna go with it. It's probably one of my favorites, if not my very favorite. So in that first chapter on the Impressionists, I talk about this fake protest that happened. And I can't remember even what year it was. It was probably like 2015, 2016, 2015, I just pulled it up. There was a fake protest outside of the Museum of Modern Art in Boston that was basically run by a, an Instagrammer guy. And his whole deal was that he wanted to protest Renoir painting just because, because he hated them. It wasn't like there was something <laughs> in it that was disturbing or that he was, you know, an anti-Semite or any of these other things that you might normally point to an artist in the historical past and say like, that guy's a bad guy. Like Picasso is a huge misogynist. So a lot of people don't like Picasso, that's okay. There's really nothing to dislike hugely about Auguste Pierre, Auguste Renoir. He's bland and 
his art is just, again, this kind of like pretty impressionist art. But this guy hated them so much that he began this Instagram page, this, this channel basically, that was just all about how much he hated these insipid paintings was what he called them. And to be fair, I like people like Monet and Mary Cassatt and Bert Morso and things like that more than I like Renoir. I don't think he's a bad artist, but a lot of people do, which is really funny. Um, and I think part of that is because he wasn't as much of a risk taker as the other guys. And he did paint some scenes just because he wanted them to be pretty. And there was this wonderful quote I found, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was off the top of my head. Oh, but Renoir wrote to one of his friends in a letter and said, why shouldn't art be pretty? There are enough unpleasant things in the world. And <laughs> I love that. And in some ways, like he's getting so much pushback from, you know, contemporary people who are half joking today because he's not a very revolutionary artist. Mm. But in some ways, if you turn that back around, I think it's kind of revolutionary to be someone who's pushing back against people who want him to be revolutionary mm. and saying, it's okay to do something unpopular just because I want to create something nice. And I really like that. I've got to hand it to the guy. I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> The thing that didn't make it into that snackable section because it just ended up getting too long and I had to cut some stuff was that I included a little section that talked about this, the, the fake protest and some of the signs that people were carrying around. There were like 20 people who were part of this protest and they had ones that was like, you know, Renoir is the, you know, it was like the typical things you'd expect, like Renoir, Renoir is the worst. And there was one rhyming one that ended, I don't remember it all, but it ended with like, Renoir makes a stinking pile. And I was like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> you guys are trying so hard. <laughs> yeah. Oof. I know. Um, it's like it, it wasn't a real reason to protest. And I, I kind of love that though. Hated yeah, that the sake I of it. There are enough beautiful things. There are most <laughs> terrible things. Let's try and make something beautiful. I think you saw right. I know. Not wrong. I see, both sides. I see both sides so clearly. I get it. <laughs> kind of mm -hmm. dig it. Well, I think that maybe we'll leave it there for tonight. I just want to thank you so much, uh, Carolyn and Jennifer, and to our audience for coming. We really appreciate having thank you, you all. here. Uh, the book is available online and in store at antiesbooks.com. Thank you all so much for coming. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.